you may be wondering, what the hell is he going on about, woolly mammoths? <laughs> well, actually, as hopefully you will see, I think they pose the biggest threat to nation branding um, for reasons which I will reveal. But let's start with... Uh, I'm doing two hands at once here. Um, give you this quiz. I want you to guess who this person is. Born 1948, has two brothers, is English, is divorced, is a devoted father, he owns many homes, quite a few in the UK, one or two around the world, likes travelling the world, he's a member of the Church of England, a very devout member of the Church of England, loves music, going to the theatre, dedicates his spare time to charities such as the Prince's Trust, and really does like being quite outspoken in public. Any thoughts on who this might be? I normally get at least one person in the audience getting right. might be a reflection of how international this audience is. But uh, if you were to say Prince Charles... Uh, you see, people are kicking themselves. Okay, I knew it was Prince Charles. You wouldn't be wrong. You wouldn't be wrong. But it's also Ozzy Osbourne. And this is the strange thing, how we assimilate facts. And I loved... Jonathan's description of unit of analysis, you know, around nations and the borders that we put on information. That's what brands are. They're, they're borders that we put around things. And what I'm going to cover today are four things. The roots of stereotyping, uh, for reasons which I'll explain, and the impact that brands themselves have on nation branding, both positive and negative. I also want to spend a little bit of time subverting some stereotypes that you may have in your head. And ultimately, just a couple of suggestions on what I think um, nations could do to get towards a better branding for themselves. So, oh. we're well coordinated intellectually. <coughs> right. There we go. Back to back to woolly mammoths. What's their relevance for all of this? Well, 1.8 million years ago, if I've got my um, anthropology and history right, when we were becoming hunter-gatherers, we were able to assimilate, or we learned and have evolved to assimilate information um, within our heads for survival reasons. You, know, you don't stand there in front of a woolly mammoth going, well, let me see, that's probably weighing about four and a half tons. It can probably travel at a speed of about 25 miles an hour when it's going full pelt for maybe one and a half minutes. Um, and I can do 12 miles an hour at full pelt for about 30 seconds, by which time you've been trampled on or your dinner's run away. Now, we have evolved uh, to such a point that we do apply stereotypes to things. If I said to you, a Nigerian gentleman, or a Chinese 24-year-old lady, or a 75-year-old Argentinian man. Maybe your head is already, even if you've never met people from those nations, and certainly of those ages from those nations, to be more specific, your mind, based on certain information you've assimilated over your lifetime, is already formulating a picture of who, who those people might be. And that stereotyping is there for very good survival techniques. But there's a downside to stereotyping, because it means we apply that gathered information to certain situations when actually they may be wrong. So if I say Nigeria, or China, or Kenya, or Britain, you'll have certain perceptions based on whether you live here, you've traveled here, you've spoken to friends who've traveled there, what you've seen in the media, going back to, I think it was Dr. Crawley's presentation earlier. And indeed, there's, there's an even, if you like, more insidious bedfellow of stereotyping. That's self-stereotyping. It's the ability to which we can ourselves conform to stereotypes that we believe people will have of us. I'm fortunate, or maybe unfortunate, that my parents gave me the name Crispin. And you know, people sort of go, oh, well, Crispin, he must be that sort of type of person. I actually grew up in the East End of London. You can imagine growing up in the East End of London with a name like Crispin was really easy. Um, but we have these self-stereotypes. And it's interesting, when I um, lived in Singapore, I remember arriving there, and I was very fortunate, office of 80 people, I think there were 77 who were non-expats, there were just three of us, an American, two Americans and myself. And 
people say, oh, what is it about the Brits? They're so good at settling in, you know, and, and they seem to be able to travel everywhere. Well, no, it's because the Brits who true, choose to go abroad and have the wonderful experience of living abroad, by definition, 99 out of 100 of them are going to settle pretty well, and that applies to people of any nation. I'm not just saying that to, to Brits. But I found myself, after a little while, having to subvert some of the self-stereotypes that I had brought. And, of course, you know, you get the wisecracks about, oh, you're colonial and all the rest of it, even though colonial days are no long before my generation. Um, so I think, you know, the issue of stereotyping and self-stereotyping is a very important one. And if you magnify that up onto a nation level, it becomes even more important. Now, um, I mentioned in the introduction some of my background, and I want to talk about the impact, very briefly, of brands on nation branding. Now, I have to declare my hand here. This is when I was living in Singapore. That's unbelievable. It's not me in the red wig, by the way. That's me right on the right-hand side. Um, you can tell it was rather a long time ago, not least by the hairdo, the lack of lines, lack of grey hair, and the funny trousers that I'm wearing. <laughs> sort of Simon Cowell-esque. Um, anyway, I have uh, been very fortunate in having a 30-year career being associated with brands. So as you can imagine, I'm very positive, very supportive, because they paid my mortgage over that period. Um, so I'm not here to denigrate them in any respect. And I think, you know, they are... Here's an example. Um, there are many, many benefits of brands. Wherever you travel in the world, they provide consistency, familiarity, reassurance, and they provide wealth and generate wealth and profits for the companies. And you can get into a political debate around capitalism versus socialism, but generally speaking, you know, they, they have many benefits. Um, however, when it comes to nation branding, this is a picture of where I live, down in leafy Surrey, uh, it's a place called Godalming, and this is our high street. Well, actually, it's, a, it's one of the two main streets. Now, if you look at it, um, you can see there's a local wedding shop, a nice English pub. Uh, there's probably a craft shop down on the right-hand side. What you don't see is the other high street, um, where it's more typically populated by brands like Costa. And I actually Googled this, trying to find a Costa logo of, or Costa picture, um, from Godalming High Street and came across this article where there's been outrage of, um, you know, Grumpy of Surrey who said, this is ridiculous that these brands are coming in. You know, um, one of the big bookstores came in and took away one of the local bookstores. And you get that passion coming through at a very local community level. Um, so, you know, whilst there are many benefits of brands, the reality is, you know, if we go around the world these days, um, you're likely to see, you, you step off, uh, I think Serbia was mentioned earlier. You know, I was in Serbia recently, come out of the airport, there's McDonald's. I do remember going to Russia for the first time about 25 years ago on holiday. And uh, Moscow, the McDonald's had just opened. And I was traveling on the Trans-Siberian Express and people were buying Big Macs and traveling with them for three days to Irkutsk to show them to their relatives, you know, this sort of bizarre American thing called a Big Mac had just arrived in the country. So, you know, they're, um, brands in the context of nation branding represent both a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge is that as you go around the world, one could argue brands are making the whole cultural experience more anodyne, less differentiated, and the whole beauty and joy of cultural immersion is being lost. But herein, I think, lies the opportunity. Because if one goes back to our dear friend the woolly mammoth and think about subverting stereotypes, I think there's a real opportunity for here for some self-awareness of nations to understand what stereotypes other people outside the countries might have and to leverage them or subvert them positively to promote themselves. Now, I did a little bit of research um, leading up to this, just to look at some stereotypes that might exist, both positive and negative. And I do apologize to anybody in the audience who's from one, of, one or more of the nations that I've picked out from a negative point of view to subvert positive. I've tried to weave in a positive one at all points. But let's start 
here in the UK. And uh, one of the earlier speakers talked about here in Britain, you know, we have the pleasure, the benefit of having the, what's termed the mother of all parliaments, um, even though we don't have a constitution. Now, interestingly, though, according to a survey that I read, the UK actually only ranks 14th in terms of democracy based on certain criteria. Now, if you think, again, I think, Jonathan, you mentioned you're from Scotland. My wife is from Scotland. I've just endured the whole debate. Uh, we are still married, I'm pleased to say, just. Um, what's interesting, actually, I, I did a quick calculation, and it was, you know, it's 55, 45% vote in favor of staying in the union. The 45% who voted against Scotland being part of the United Kingdom by my calculation, that translated to 2.34% of the United Kingdom. Now, let's say, in order to swing it, that Scotland had got independence, that would have been 3%. Potentially, you know, yes, they were voting on that form, the question, you know, should Scotland be an independent country, or whatever the wording was. But actually, the other side of looking at it, from a thinking of democracy, is that it would have taken just approximately 3% of the United Kingdom to break up the Union. Now, is that democracy? We can get into a whole debate around why the rest of the United Kingdom wasn't allowed or wasn't given that vote. But interestingly, um, also in the United Kingdom Parliament, there's a lot of debate around the numbers of women that sit in Parliament and particularly uh, sit in the Cabinet. Now, about one in five MPs in, in Britain are women, I believe. Um, now, you may be surprised to hear, thinking of the theme of sub subverting stereotypes, that the country with the greatest number of women in its parliament, does anybody know what that flag is? Quick test. Is it the Rwandan? Correct. Thank you very much. It is indeed the Rwandan flag. The Rwandan government comprises 63% of their MPs are women. Now, if you think about, and I'm not going to mention them here because we don't need to dwell on the negatives, but you think of some of the negatives that have been associated with Rwanda, and we think about some of the um, ambitions here in the UK to have more women in our parliament, one only has to look to Rwanda to understand, now, I'm sure there are many different reasons behind it, and I'm not sufficiently close to their political structure to comment on it. But I just thought it was a really interesting fact. Um, the next area, in terms of subverting stereotypes, entrepreneurship. Which country in the world do you think would be the most entrepreneurial? By various measures. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Israel. Israel, yeah. That's, that's right up there. Yeah. Um, I would have said, personally, I, if I was sat in the audience, I'd have gone, well, America, they've got a pretty good reputation for, for entrepreneurialism. Now, actually, um, against certain criteria defined by um, various world bodies, the most entrepreneurial country on Earth current, uh, sorry, in 2012, is Nigeria. Even though it does have, I have to say, the seventh, it's seventh for um, the least literate nation, but I do think it is interesting that it does top the world rankings for the most entrepreneurship by various definitions. Now going back to America, um, talking of entrepreneurialism, they rank 12th in the world for investment in research and development, yet second for the numbers of patents applied for. Now, you could say that's because they're very efficient at turning R&D investment into patented technology. Or one might say, if one wants to apply another stereotype, that they're a very litigious nation and they just want to protect everything that they do. I'm not here to comment on that, but I just think you know, when, you, when you look at statistics, you can manipulate them to either subvert a stereotype or to substantiate a, a stereotype. Staying in America, looking at personal mobility, you know, America prides itself on being a nation of car drivers. But I bet you didn't know, I'd be surprised if you knew, that the country that travels the most miles by car per capita is Chile. 28,000 miles each year 
each individual travels by car. Yet they don't even appear in the top 50 for car ownership in the world. Now, I, again, I know, or I'm sure, there are very good reasons behind that that give rise to that statistic. But it's an interesting uh, subversion of a stereotype. Uh, one of my favorite ones, talking of uh, emotion, and that being very much uh, underpinning a lot of brands. When it comes to emotion, I'm, I'm a big football. I have to say I'm an Arsenal fan. Yeah, I'm so, I feel your suffer. I feel your pain <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, but if you had to say, you know, what, what nation or what nations are the most emotional, um, you, you probably wouldn't go too, too far wrong if you looked at the Mediterranean nations like Italy or France or Greece. You know, they, 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 emotions are out there. They're wearing them on their sleeves compared to us Brits who, you know, apparently, according to the stereotype, very reserved. Um, but I bet you didn't know that Italy, for all its emotion, it's actually pretty laid back because they've got the highest number of um, marijuana smokers, apparently, in the world. <laughs> so f for all their emotion, they're sitting there quite chilled out by the whole thing. Um, which is a loose connection, a loose segue into crime. Now, you may think, yeah, America, yeah, I was in Washington, D.C. about three or four weeks ago, and before I left, my wife said, no, you will be careful, won't you, because that has the reputation, it's the stereotype of being a murder capital of America. Yet America doesn't even appear in the top 20 for countries with the murder rate. Um, now, that may be because it actually happens to have the highest prison population in the world, partly due to its size, of course, there is that factor, um, but even on a per capita basis, it works out quite well. But if I said to you, or if I asked you, which country do you think has the highest number of reported robberies? Anybody want to hazard a guess? I know this is a bit of a trick question, but... South Africa? South Africa? Okay. Okay. Well, actually... UK. Not the... UK is... It, we're pretty good on that, because we manipulate the crime statistics. <laughs> it's good old Belgium. Stereotypically famed for its beer, for its chocolate, but it tops that list. Now, that may be because it has the most honest nation and people actually report the crimes, or it may have the best, most efficient police force because they're able to resolve those. I don't know. But I just think, you know, if you wanted to apply a stereotype around Belgium, let me think that. Uh, moving more into the natural world, the great outdoors. Um, if you think of Iceland, well, I think of geysers, of sort of barren landscapes and occasionally volcanoes that really hack me off because they screw up my travel plans and my flight. But did you know that Iceland has the highest rate of reforestation of any country in the world over the last five years? So the beauty, now, that may be because the volcanoes have wiped half the forests out and they've got a program going on. Again, there's always good reasons behind statistics, but I just, as I was reading up on the research, I thought, that's, that's a, a different one. Now, back to sport. Um, Jonathan mentioned the World Cup. I had the pleasure and privilege, from a purely post personal point of view, um, back in 2006, going to the Germany World Cup. I went to watch England play Sweden in Cologne. I ended up playing football with German police in Cologne Square. I think, in, in also, and I, I just finished working for a German company around then, and I was speaking to my German colleagues, and I was saying, I think the World Cup may go down in history in Germany as the turning point when they finally gave up that burden that they've carried for 50, 60, 70 years after the war to have the self-confidence, you know, the, the whole unification piece. Because I actually, when I was there, I felt Germany drop its shoulders it wasn't the stereotype of huge efficiency. And I've worked with Mercedes, been around Mercedes factories and been hugely impressed by wonderful manufacturing and engineering efficiency. But here was another side of Germany. Here was another face that Germany gave the world through sport and really subverted a stereotype. And it wasn't just in my mind. I spoke to Swedes. I mean, we had a wonderful party out there. It was fantastic. And of course, culture appears um, as a word on the banner behind me, and an art. Now, 
I started with the Houses of Parliament. Um, coming back to the UK, this is the Tate Modern, as many of you may recognise. Um, you may think of art, um, if you were stereotyping, the countries that probably top the list for art being France, Italy, um, maybe even Russia, because they're just able to buy a load of art, I don't know, with no disrespect to their huge cultural heritage, which, by the way, next week I'm spending a week in St. Petersburg on holiday, and I'm thoroughly looking forward to going to the Hermitage and seeing everything that it has to offer. But did you know, out of the top 15 art galleries and museums in the world, the UK has the most, with four. And over 20 million visitors across those four um, go each year. So, you know, I, and I know the stereotype would be, yes, and they all happen to be located in London. You know, people do come to London, stereotypically, for the culture, for the art. But here's, here's a statistic that actually underpins and proves that. So, in closing, some thoughts on towards better nation branding, this idea of subverting stereotypes. Before I do that, there are, I would urge any country, and this is nothing new in, at some level, but for me there are three categories, thinking of brands, that have the most impact on nation branding. The first one, probably obviously, is airlines. And airlines are a great representation and it's interesting, you know, travelling the world, and I do travel a lot with British Airways out of maybe some perverse misplaced loyalty, but actually I do think they're quite good. And the main, thing, main reason I do is, is out of this stereotypical perception of safety, I believe their pilots are well trained. I'm sure they are I'm no better trained than other great airlines, but that's my perception. And I, I quite like that smooth, gravelly voice. I'm sure they've got a special machine on the, on the microphone. They're probably speaking like this, but it comes out really nice and relaxed and very calm. Um, but airlines are a huge um, signal, a huge banner for the confidence of a nation. Similarly, talked about German engineering, cars. Now, of course, it's changed slightly with ownership. You know, Mini is now owned by BMW. Mini is a quintessentially British brand. Um, certainly in its perception, but not necessarily in its financial ownership. And the last one, um, which I do a lot of work in this category, is beer. Um, you know, I happen to put Singer up here. I've been doing a lot of work in Eastern Europe with brands like Yellen, Ujusko, Nikšićko in Montenegro. They are absolutely embedded in the cultural fabric and fibre of those countries. In the same way Guinness is over here in, in Ireland, or John Smith's the bitter. Um, and by way of evidence that, I don't know if you can see this particularly clearly, but I worked a few years ago, I've just pulled this out as one example, with San Miguel, the Spanish beer. And we created a brand book. On the left is the cover for it. You won't be able to see it, but in the middle it says Embrace Contrasts. Because through the research, it was really interesting, we found that Spain is a country of contrasts. And that matched the contrasts of the beer itself. San Miguel beer is very light and very golden, yet it's 5% ABV. So it's at the higher end of sort of packing a bit of a punch. And if you look into Spanish culture, the top picture um, on the left hand right on the left hand side is a flamenco guitar, yet on the right hand side is the Ibiza rave scene. Okay. Middle picture, um, you've got El Bulli, which I think is shut down but maybe reopening up. Um, one of the world's, if not the world's, best restaurant at the time it existed oat cuisine, yet combined with very traditional food of, of tapas. And at the bottom, left-hand side, traditional Catholic country, but as I understand it, it was the first country to recognise gay weddings and civil partnerships. So a real country of contrast. And I think it's, there in, it's interesting how beer particularly, but airlines and cars as well, as brands can reflect what's going on in a nation, or indeed contribute to the subversion of stereotypes. Um, oh, that's show. And I've put up the last uh, but two slides, a model that we use for defining a brand. And I'm not going to go into it in detail, other than to say, I think nations, although I do believe they are much more complex units of analysis to use, Jonathan said, because of the nature of um, the, the, the multi-dimensions that go into making up a nation. Um, brands are, are 
pretty complicated. And think about you know a, a company with fifty thousand people completely subscribe to that view that you can create a brand, but if those 50,000 people, or if those five people within the company don't get it, it it's not going to succeed as well as it could do. Um, if anybody wants to discuss this model afterwards, very happy to do it, but my um, tenet is that nation brands can apply a model like this and develop a model, a definition of their own brand persona, in the same way that commercial brands can. Um, I was going to close on a quote I'm going to put up in a moment, but I sneaked one in, an extra one in at the end. But here's the one I was going to close on. Peter Ustinov, he said, I imagine hell like this. Italian punctuality, German humour and English wine. Well, I've figured out where the Italian punctuality comes from now. They're all sitting there going, yeah, we'll make it one day. <laughs> uh, my last quote, though, I did sneak in from uh, Dr. Gurner <coughs> earlier, where he said, the problem of subtle differentiation is crucial and I, I love that because I think as brands going back to my earlier point as brands come in and, and spread around the world and create um, that conformity uh, that similarity nations will have to work harder to cherish the cultural differences that they have and I think they will have to work hard on this subtle differentiation thank you very much um, I don't know if I'm going to dodge that bullet by answering it in a different way. No, as you were talking, I was just thinking, um, I was last week talking to a Russian about who's, who's living in Russia but was over here about the situation in Ukraine. And it was an idle, que well, idle, it was a genuine, curious question on my part on how are things there. And he said, well, it's incredible. He lives in Moscow. And he said, we are being given completely the other side of the story. And I do remember watching uh, a piece a few years ago when Chechnya and the problems there. And I happened to be flicking, because I do like watch, watching Russian TV on Sky, just to see what's being reported. I'll watch Al Jazeera just to you know, mix things up a bit. But there was a piece where a Chechnyan flag was being um, put on a roof. On Sky News, it was the rebels regain the territory from Russia. From the Russian news, it was they were removing the flag. It's exactly the same piece of footage, probably fed in by Reuters or, or you know, who, who, Agent Press or whatever. Um, so anyway, the, the answer to your question or, or the thought that it gave me is with media and particularly social media, and we've seen this you know, in, in areas like Syria and Israel, particularly the, the West Bank, you know, some of the reporting that's gone on there, I think, um, the, the relativity is going to be more difficult for nations to protect a particular point of view. Um, maybe less so for the people living in the country at the particular time, but certainly on a world stage. And that may or may not, may perpetuate stereotypes or it may subvert the stereotype that people have. Um, because as you say, you know, I have been to Russia a few times, know a few Russians. In my head, the stereotype is very different. It's why I'm thrilled next week to be going, you know, I've chosen to take my family to St. Petersburg for a week because I just know it's going to be a fantastic experience. Yeah, a couple, yeah. couple of thoughts come to mind. One is back to the earlier uh, point when you were discussing with Jonathan about 50,000 people working for a, country, uh, for a company. You know, here the population, I don't know, between 65 and 70 million in the UK. There are 65 to 70 million ambassadors of the brand UK that if you're the owner of, I don't know who is the owner of Nation Brand UK, is it the Prime Minister, is it the Queen, or you know, whoever it might be, I mean it's all of us, uh, all of us who are, are British, um, yeah, how do you influence positively those, those people to promote that brand? The second thought going through my mind is, you know, there are some stereotypes that you just, or some um, loyalties that they're underpinned by stereotypes, you will never shift. I, will, I guarantee you, no matter how brilliant this particular brand performs, I will never, ever switch loyalty to support Chelsea. Never. Yet, if I look at its brand performance over the last 10 years, tracking it against certain criteria, 
I would have to say it's, it's just about outperforming my brand at the moment. Maybe if we looked at you know, the whole picture of the history of the brand, we might get a, a slightly different picture. Same is true, I think, is, is fascinating in politics. Um, the degree to which, actually, you get, let's take UK politics, of course it's being shaken up a little bit at the moment, but historically two dominant parties, and there's obviously a group of people in the middle who are open to swaying their stereotypes, but generally speaking, you know, once you're born into a certain type of party, born, I don't mean in the literal sense, but once you've kind of made up your mind, whether it's because your parents voted or actually you're not voting that way because your parents voted, you want to do something completely different. Chances are very, I, I don't know the stats, but I would imagine people do stay, they stick with that loyalty through thick and thin in the same way that as a suffering Arsenal or Man United fan, we haven't had the same pleasure that Alex has had over the last few years. So, yeah. Well, also as a Brit, the word Commonwealth, I apply my stereotype to it, and it, I, it's got the wrong stereotype, if you think. You know. it, I have, through learning and understanding more about what the ICD does, it has changed my view of the word Commonwealth in that context, and, and I do understand it. So I think um, maybe I'd answer it in this way. One, one has to be very self-aware comes back to self-stereotyping. I think nations must be very self-aware um, in the same way that brands must be or organisations. You know, the word Commonwealth comes in here. What connotations, what stereotypes are being applied to that? Be, be very aware of it and then understand where you might need to pull a lever to subvert that stereotype or indeed to promote it even further. <laughs>